All right, let's have your attention again. Lecture B, uh, we want to focus on applications of Taylor series to math. Um, one application in math itself is to help you graph functions if you didn't happen to have technology. Okay, we'll to help you. Uh, for example, let's take this example we just did at the end of lecture A. What if you wanted to graph e to the x times cosine of x, um, but you didn't have any technology handy, and you needed to do it, to do it, your life depended on it or something? Okay, well, first of all, you'd only be able to graph it well near a, near zero in this case. You would not be able to graph it well otherwise. Although you could think about the nature of these functions to perhaps extend your graph. I, maybe we'll try such a thing. But what would its graph look like in year zero? Here's the way the Taylor polynomial, the Taylor series starts. This is equal to this function for all x. And if I truncated, any truncated version of this is approximately equal to this when x is close to zero. And the approximation gets better and better as x gets closer to zero. So as a first, a zeroth order approximation, you might say, use the constant function 1, though that's not very good. It does have the right vertical intercept, though. At x equals 0, it equals 1. And that is the correct value of this at x equals 0. E to the 0 is 1, cosine of 0 is 1. As a first order approximation, use 1 plus x, a linear function with a y-intercept of 1 and a slope of 1. Draw a little line with a slope of 1 through this point. Looks like I drew it too steep there. The graph of e to the x cosine of x looks like that line when x is close to 0. Not very much of the graph. There is no x squared term. If there were an x squared term, if it was like plus x squared in there, then the graph would be look like an upward opening parabola near here. There is no x squared term. So evidently, this has got an inflection point at x equals 0. And looks like this, a cubic, without an x squared term, as you move a little further away from 0. What does the graph of this look like? Well, it's a cubic with a negative coefficient of x cubed. We know such graphs of such cubics, well, let, me not, let me not put axes, but have this kind of shape, either like this or like this. Cubics with negative coefficient for the x cubed term look like this or like that. Now, our graph is already increasing at x equals 0. It must look like this one. And again, yes, because there's no x squared term, the second derivative of this function at 0 is going to be 0. This is going to be actually an inflection point. It's going to be concave down to the right of that point and concave up to the left of the point. The next highest degree of x for this particular thing is a fourth degree, and it has a negative coefficient for x to the fourth. Can I use that to maybe go a little further still? We know fourth degree polynomials with negative coefficients for x to the fourth have graphed that either look like this or maybe like this. Because of that, probably it's that kind of thing as we get further away from the zero, though I'm, I'm getting into territory where I'm feeling less certain about it. So I made it dash. Could we use the nature of these functions to continue? We could try. For example, the cosine function will cross the x-axis at pi over 2. Now cosine of pi over 2 is 0. Yeah. This has got to have an x-intercept of pi over 2. And at negative pi over 2, though, the graph, hmm, I didn't have it exactly symmetric here, so I'm, I'm, it does cross a negative pi over 2, but that's making my graph start to look less accurate here. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe it comes down faster here to make it cross at negative pi over 2 as well. I'm feeling less certain about it. 
Um, but I do know it's going to cross those values of x. Because of the e to the x, the oscillations are going to grow in amplitude when x is positive and decrease in amplitude when x is negative. So probably it continues something like this over here, but then something like this over here. Let's see if I'm right. Let's see how right I am. Okay, come on. Plot e to the x times cosine of x for x, say, between negative, we want to include pi over 2, plus or minus pi over 2 in this. And probably even plus or minus 3 pi over 2, so we see some more roots. 3 pi over 2 is going to be, I don't know, about, uh, what, 4.7 or something. If I go to negative 5 to 5, we'll see those. It's not looking too much like my graph on the board yet because, well, we're not near zero. I am seeing that I was, well, I was uh, too quick to make this go up over here. It is concave up over here, but evidently, as x goes backwards here, we don't go up over there. If we zoom in near x equals zero, actually, let's just make this a two here, or a three. Okay, so my graph is off. It is an inflection point here. It's concave down there, concave up here, but not so much concave up over here that it comes back up. So I was wrong. I make mistakes. It does cross there, right there. That is negative pi over 2. This is positive pi over 2. It's going to cross again at negative 3 pi over 2, somewhere right around there, at positive 3 pi over 2. The oscillations you can see are definitely getting pretty big here on the right. And they're definitely getting pretty small on the left. If I graph it from negative 5 to 5, you'd see some, or maybe negative 10 to negative 1, and might see the oscillations better. Well, they're, they're decaying so fast, you're not really seeing the oscillations real well over there. And there, if the oscillation gets so big, you don't even see it all. That's not even good enough. There we go. Look at the vertical scale now. The oscillations are getting really big on the right. Okay, so yeah, it can help you graph, but I made mistakes in my guessing as well, right in there. I like that instead. It is concave up over there. Where it doesn't head up that way. So there is a application graphing, sort of, okay, with some mistakes. Um, let's take another example. Let's go back to that square root example. <coughs> yeah. My phone is buzzing here. You can hear it. Somebody desperately wants to get a hold of me. What was the series for one, a square root of 1 plus x? It was this. It's got a y-intercept of 1. It's got a linear approximation that's 1 plus x over 2. So the slope near x equals 0 would be 1 half. The slope at x equals 0 would be 1 half exactly at the tangent line. Got a negative coefficient for x squared. So when x is close to 0, it's going to look like a parabola opening downward. Positive coefficient for x cubed, it starts to get a little bit unclear once we get into the higher degree terms. But I'm pretty confident that near zero, near x equals zero, it's going to look about like this. Slope of one half when across the y-axis at one with a slight bit of concave down nature to it. Because the coefficient of x squared is negative. Actually, you should know what this graph looks like without that knowledge. It's the square root graph shifted to the left by one. Oh, that's a bad scale. Huh. There we go. Take the square root graph, shift it to the left by one, you get this graph. Yep. Y intercept of one, 
Slope is one half there of tangent line. For example, if you follow the tangent line one half unit to the right, y goes up by half of that 0.25, following the tangent line from 1 to 1.25. Up there. And yes, it's concave down. The coefficient of x squared was negative. Okay. What else can you apply Taylor series to? Uh, you can apply it to calculating the limits. Another mathematical application. Limits of functions like this are not really interesting because those are continuous. You just plug in whatever you're letting x approach anyway. More interesting limits are limits of quotients where, well, you could use L'Hopital's rule if you wanted to, to, to evaluate this limit instead. Actually, let's do, make it a little bit more interesting. This limit can be evaluated with L'Hopital's rule. Remember L'Hopital's rule? Take the derivative of both. The top and the bottom individually, but only if it's what's called an indeterminate form. In this case, it is. Both the top and the bottom are going to zero. They call that a zero over zero indeterminate form, as x goes to zero. And in that situation, you can use L'Hopital's rule. To say this limit is the limit of a new ratio where the numerator of the new ratio is the derivative of the old numerator, and the denominator of the new ratio, it's not a negative sign, is the derivative of the old denominator. That's a continuous function at x equals 0. You can now just plug in 0. The answer is 5 fourths. If you didn't know L'Hopital's rule, which again can, it can only be applied in some circumstances, you apply the L'Hopital's rule when it's not allowed to be applied, to it, you get wrong answers. But this is a zero over zero indeterminate form. You also can use Taylor series here. You can replace sine of 5x with its Taylor series, which would be this series with 5x in place of x. So you get 5x. Place that x with 5x. Minus 5x quantity cubed over 3 factorial. It's center. We're actually not going to need more than the first term. Help us evaluate this limit. You can factor out an x out of the top. You can write it as x times in parentheses 5 Minus, let me just go ahead for the sake of it, go ahead and simplify this. 5 cubed is 125, 3 factorial is 6. I had an x cubed, but I factor out an x, so it leaves me with an x squared, etc. Now I can cancel those x's. And that's valid to do because the value of the limit doesn't depend on what happens to the function at x equals 0. And the the simplified function will equal the original function as long as x does not equal 0. So you get the limit as x goes to 0 of 5 minus 125 over 6x squared, etc. over 4. Now that's a continuous function at x equals 0. You can plug in 0 and get 5 fourths. Same answer. So that would be another application, so to speak of Taylor series to pure math. Those, sometimes calculating limits is necessary in physics, for example. It's a necessary thing to do sometimes. Do you have a question? Any questions about that? <coughs> you can come up with more complicated examples. Um, let's see, what's the limit? As x goes to 0 of, let's do 1 minus cosine of 
x squared over x to the fourth. This is a zero over zero indeterminate form. As x goes to zero, both the top and the bottom go to zero, because cosine of zero is one. So you could try L'Hopital's rule. And I think if you use L'Hopital's rule enough times, maybe four times because of the fourth power down there, it would get you to the answer. This one, it might be quicker to use the series, actually, than L'Hopital's rule, because you only apply the series once. What's the series for cosine of x squared? It's the series for cosine with x squared in place of x. The ones cancel. What you're left with up top has an x to the fourth and an x to the sixth. The next one would be x squared to the sixth, which would be x to the, oh, that, excuse me, that would be x to the eighth, sorry. The next one would be x squared to the sixth, which would be x to the twelfth. Question? Well, so would we just leave x to the fourth as it is? We wouldn't take the Taylor series of it? Well, the Taylor series of x to the fourth is x to the fourth. So oh, you just leave it as x right. to the fourth. For any polynomial, its Taylor series is itself, essentially, written in the typical way if you are doing it centered at zero. That makes sense. What are you left with? Don't forget about bringing this minus sign through. A minus of a minus is plus. We're going to have a one half here for the first one. And then a um, minus 124. This was an x to the eighth. I factored out an x to the fourth. It's going to leave me with an x to the fourth. The x to the fourth now cancel. And again, this is valid to do because the value of the limit is independent of what happens to the function at zero. And these functions, the original function and the simplified function, are the same as long as x is not zero. So their limits, if they exist, would be the same. This limit is going to be a half. The answer is a half. Mm -hmm. I'm just a little bit confused. So how did you get from 1 minus the Taylor series? How did you? put that x to the fourth into the numerator. I factored it out. I simplified it in my head there. Oh, you factored it out? So I brought the negative sign through. Okay. This is the same as x to the fourth over 2 minus x to the eighth over 24 plus the next one would be x to the twelfth over 720. And all those terms, you can factor an x to the fourth out. That's what I did. And then I can cancel with the x to the fourth from the bottom. The whole one appears to be a half if I've not made a mistake. You can approximate integrals with series. The integral of sine of x squared does not have an elementary antiderivative. So if you were trying to use the fundamental theorem of calculus <coughs> to evaluate a definite integral for this, there's no function that you're familiar with to be able to use for an antiderivative. <coughs> there is a function, it's just something you're not used to. What function is it? It's got a name. It's called the Fresnel S function. The S stands for sine. It's a special function. I think I have I shown you Fresnel before? Not that I remember. Okay. It's not a function you're used to. 
So you either have to have technology that can deal with Fresnel functions, or you'd have to do numerical integration if you were doing a definite integral, or use series. At least if I'm integrating this over some interval near zero, I can maybe use a truncated version of the series for this to approximate the answer. Actually, let's write the actual answer as a series initially for an antiderivative. Use the series for sine of, sine of x and replace the x's with x squareds. You're going to get x squared minus x squared cubed over 3 factorial plus x squared to the fifth over 5 factorial, etc. Simplify a little bit before we integrate. That's x squared minus 1 sixth x to the sixth plus 1 over 120 x to the uh, x to the tenth. Now integrate term by term. The series for this function Fresnel S with the square roots of 2 pi and pi over 2 in there evidently are what starts 1 third x cubed minus 1 42nd x to the 7th, right? 6 times 7, 42, plus 120 times 11 would be what? 100 and, uh, 1320 x to the 11. Is that evidently true for all x? This is an antiderivative of sine of x squared as a series. Maybe we should check that with series here. Series for this thing. About zero. I want to see at least to the eleventh degree term, so I'll put an eleven here. Did we do it right? Looks good. So now you can use a truncated version of this to approximate a definite interval for this. Near x equals zero. You want it to be on an interval close to zero. Like oh say 0 to 0 0.5. It'd be approximately what I get when I plug in 0 into this, say up to that degree, plug in 0.5, excuse me, minus what I get when I plug in 0. When I plug in 0, I get 0. So this is going to be approximately 1 third times 0.5 cubed minus 1 42nd times 0.5 to the 7. I mean, the next term is going to be so small anyway, I might, might as well not even include it. Let's see how all this does. So I'll, I'll find an actual numerical integral, integral. I can use n integrate. I'll just type an integral here. There's our approximation to that integral. Well, hopefully, if I simplify that number, it's not too far away. 0.5 cubed over 3. Maybe that's even close. It's 0.5 cubed over 3. That's not even too far away. Minus 0.5 to the 7th power over 42, I'm sure will get us probably to the same answer to that many decimal places. Not quite. Well, okay, if you round, that would be a one. Okay, is another mathematical application of series. What else did I mention at the beginning of class? Uh, graphing limits and approximations. I guess we just did an approximation there. You can approximate functions as well. You know, what is, let's take a simple example this time. What is sine of 0.5 approximately? Not the integral of sine of x squared from 0 to 0.5, but something simpler, sine of 
Well, according to the Taylor series for sine, that's truncated at the cubic power, this should be approximately 0.5 minus 0.5 cubed over 3 factorial. Let's see how well that does. Sine of 0.5. About 0 0.479426, 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 cubed over 3 factorial, which is over 6, is pretty close. So you can approximate function values. Seems silly, perhaps, in the age of technology that we're in. It still is a good idea to learn these approximations. We will use series a little bit for differential equations, maybe even before the exam for some simple examples. But in more complicated differential equations, using series expansions not just for solutions but also for the differential equations themselves turns out to help you solve problems. It's a problem solving term tool, not just for approximations but to actually say things about certain differential equations. Prove are true. Even. To end class today, I want to introduce the next section, section 10.4. Introduce the idea of an error function. have to be functions. Anytime you're approximating something in math through some method, you could be off by a certain amount. You could have an error. We talked about errors with numerical integration, right? And in general, you can say the error in your approximation, you could phrase it as it's the actual value minus the approximate value. mentioned this with numerical integration. <coughs> it is fortunate that actual comes before approximate in the dictionary. That helps me remember the order of these things. In the context of using Taylor polynomials to approximate functions, the actual value is the function itself, and the approximate value is the Taylor polynomial of a certain degree. About Taylor polynomials here now, not Taylor series. So we have a finite number of terms, We're truncating the series at some point. And the error is equal to that. You could just call it error, but you could also just give it a name like O capital E of X. Although in Mathematica you wouldn't want to use capital E because that's reserved for the number. So in Mathematica I'll use maybe a little E. Or maybe I'll just call it error. I'll, I'll give it a word for the function. This is a function of x. Take the sine function as an example. So f of x is sine of x. Let's deal with the fifth degree Taylor polynomial. I'll just call it p5. I won't bother the subscripts here. There would be x minus x cubed over 3 factorial, which is 6, plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial, which is 120. The error function is the actual value minus the approximate value. And it can be thought of as a function, and you can find its value. You can type in, what is error at 0.5? It's pretty small. What is error at 1.5. Still probably pretty small, though should be bigger. By small, I mean close to zero. By big, I mean far from zero. This is negative. That happens to be negative as well, further from zero. The error gets bigger in absolute value, generally speaking, the further x gets from zero. By the time we get x to 10.5, maybe it's pretty big. Yeah, negative 882 for the error. So you can find values of these things, and you can also plot these functions. Question? 
So when we're doing like sine of x and putting the x in the series, does the x not have to be between negative one and one in that case? Not for the sine function because the series equals okay. the sine function over the entire room on the line. The negative one to one is only for the geometric series basic example that we did and the, the binomial one. You can graph these functions too. Which graph is which? I hope you can tell. The blue graph is the sine function. The orangish graph, it's a little hard to see the color here. The orangish graph, this one, if you're colorblind, uh, that matches the sine function real well near zero, but not so well as you get further away from zero. That's the Taylor polynomial, three, five. And the greenish one, that's the error. It's real close to zero when x is close to zero. Because the other two graphs are real close together when x is close to zero. The error is positive over here when x is negative. Because the approximation is too small, this difference will be positive when the approximate value is too small. The orange graph is under the blue graph. It's negative when x is positive. The approximation is too big when x is positive. The orange graph is above the blue graph. That's the basic idea of the error function. To ultimately get to our goal of understanding why the Taylor series for e to the x, cosine of x, and sine of x especially, equal those functions for all, that, all x, we need to get a handle on error. We need to come up with what's called a bound for the error to help us understand why we get equality for all x. And that'll be a goal for probably next Monday. Friday we'll focus on physics and other applications.